Good evening. I'm Suheili Bautista Carolina, Senior Managing Educator of Audience Development and Engagement in the Education Department at the Met. <laughs> and I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight to Black Power Kitchen at the Met. I'd like to acknowledge the Met's location in Lenape Hoking, homeland of the Lenape diaspora, and historically a gathering and trading place for many diverse native peoples who continue to live and work on this island. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities, past, present, and future for their ongoing and fundamental relationships to the region. Today marks a special moment as Ghetto Gastro launches the multi-city book tour for their debut cookbook, Black Power Kitchen by Artisan Books. <laughs> it is a joy to see you all here today, and there is absolutely no doubt that the Bronx is in the building. <laughs> I cannot imagine a better occasion to bring us together than today's subject of freedom, food, and nourishment. Nourishment not only of the body, as John, Pierre, and Lester remind us, but also of the mind and soul. In Ghetto Gastro's own words, Black Power Kitchen is a celebration of black culture and an indispensable cookbook one that arms readers with 75 recipes, more than 150 photographs by Naquan Schuler and Joshua Woods, and thought-provoking contributions on topics ranging from the work of black mothers to the importance of resistance and rebellion. If you have already held this powerful, visually stunning book in your hands, you already know that Black Power Kitchen is not simply just a cookbook. It is a love letter to the Bronx, a manifesto, a collector's item, a call to action, and much, much more. Thank you to the Lip Bar, the Bronx's only black-owned bookstore, for joining us this evening to sell signed copies of Black Power Kitchen. <laughs> We're delighted to be presenting this program today in conjunction with the exhibition, Hear Me Now, the Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina, organized by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, which is on view at the Met until February 5th, 2023. For their support of the exhibition, we extend our sincere thanks to Catherine Plotz Salmanowitz, the Met's Fund for Diverse Art Histories, the Terror Foundation for American Art, Anthony W. and Lulu C. Wang, the Peter J. Sharp Foundation, and the Henry Luce Foundation. We're also grateful to the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust for their support of tonight's program and the Civic Practice Partnership Artist in Residence Program, a program in which one of Ghetto Gastro's very own is now a recent alum. When Ghetto Gastro co-founder John Gray joined us at the Met in 2020 as an artist in residence in this two-year program for civic-minded artists and creatives, he instantly gravitated towards an object in the Met's collection titled Storage Jar 1858 by, Drake, by David, which is not only currently on view in the exhibition Hear Me Now, but can be found among the many artworks featured in the pages of Black Power Kitchen an example of the interconnectedness between food and art, and also of the continuous dialogue between the African diaspora that extends beyond any concepts of space and time. Inscribed on the jar is the following. When you fill this jar with pork or beef, Scott will be there to get a piece. Not only is Drake referencing the jar's intended contents, but his creative word choice and declaration of authorship is manifest. Drake's poetry speaks to the trauma of slavery, but also signals the agency and power of a gifted artisan in the plantation economy. John responded to this inscription by stating, and quote, he was rapping. David Drake, as an enslaved African man in South Carolina where it was illegal for him to read and write, he wrote that. I definitely consider it an act of resistance and rebellion. And then it's also just so beautiful. I know we're all eager to hear about the beauty, resistance, and rebellion presented in the Black Power Kitchen from today's speaker. Participating in our conversation today are Ghetto Gastro's co-founders and authors of Black Power Kitchen, John Gray, Pierre Serrao, and Lester Walker. 
Joining them is James Beard, a winning award, James Beard, a winning award writer and co-author of Black Power Kitchen, Osai Endelin. Their conversation will be moderated by Dr. Jessica B. Harris, a renowned American culinary historian, professor, journalist, and the author of 12 critically acclaimed books, including the New York Times bestselling, High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America. Before I welcome to them to the stage, I'd like to thank several colleagues from across the museum who made tonight's program possible, including staff in education, special events, visitor experience, development, external affairs, security, bon appetit, and curatorial, as well as the fantastic people I had the pleasure to dream with at Ghetto Gastro, Artisan Books, Carter Media Group, and Huxley. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming John, Pierre, Lester, Osai, and Dr. Harris to the stage. Welcome, welcome. Can I get a ear one time from the congregation? Yeah. Big up to Suheli for that beautiful introduction and thank you. Bearing with my midnight text messages with crazy ask and demands. Love you. Okay. <laughs> I can already see it's out of control. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to this evening celebrating the publication of Black Power Kitchen presented by three guys, sort of from the Bronx, John Gray, Pierre Serrao, and Lester Walker, collectively known as Ghetto Gastro. And just FYI, the book is already heading to its second edition. My name is Jessica Harris, and the guys were generous enough and perhaps foolish enough to ask me to write the foreword to their book and also moderate this evening's discussion. But back in the green room, Lester just sort of let out with one of those sort of Lesterisms that drops from the side of his mouth, and he said, mm, from Mott Haven to the Met. So I think that's what we're talking about tonight, from Mott Haven to the Met. <laughs> I did. I listen. So tonight we're going to spend some time with them and with writer Osai Endolin, who has corralled the thoughts and words of these fast-moving, fast-thinking, fast-talking folks into a book that is a must-own for anyone who cares about, is connected to, or wants to know more about, or is just plain curious about the multiple aspects of black culture in the third decade of the 21st century. In writing the foreword, I was blown away by the way in which the past is prologue and how the present connects us with the past and leads us to the future. So, my first question to y'all is, y'all call yourselves Ghetto Castro. And y'all's name alone uses two terms that might make some folks of my generation wince. What do you mean when you say Ghetto Gastro, and what are you telling us? When we decided on going with the name Ghetto Gastro, it was really about taking things that often people don't think go together and creating this combustion and a collision of ideas, like being from the Bronx, growing up, which I feel is a beacon of creative culture, but often overlooked and underestimated, and being with my brothers that had the crazy culinary training in the gastro world. It's like, how do we take the reference points from our childhood and create a vehicle where we could capture the value that we're creating versus just having it extracted by other cultures? So that's what Ghetto Gastro is about. Okay, thank you. What John said, I mean, yeah, I think, I think for us it's really just about spreading the message, creating the space for us to exist that we didn't see before and, you know, just being great. We all keep it real, man. It's about indicting the systems of neglect and apathy that have, you know, that have plagued our communities for years, you know? Turning that, turning that word back around on them and um, making something luxurious and, and wavy out of it. <laughs> wavy indeed. 
And I'll just add, as someone not in Ghetto Gastro, but who spent the last few years learning to speak Ghetto Gastro and distilling what that voice looks and sounds like, uh, it is also a reclamation of the things that have already been uh, extracted from and celebrated by other cultures, but not centered in the place where they are often birthed. And so Ghetto Gastro is that collision, that combustion, but also that saying, the center is here and you need not look further. We will, but you don't need to really. So it's that too. Okay. Now, if you've been following them, and if I could see you, I would suspect that some of you have, you know the book is doing what the guys do best, blowing up on all media. A few nights ago, I was tickled to watch Lester as he presented Trevor Noah with a gift of clothing. Yeah, you got it. Tell us about that. Ah, oh, man, you know, so my mother always told me never show up to anyone's house, man, empty-handed, you know, and uh, that was basically an act of endearment. You know, we, we like to crown our kings and our queens while they're here and give them their flowers while they're here. And also just being unapologetically black, man, you know, just showing the world how we give it up, man, giving, you know, crowning them and uh, showing them that do-rag diplomacy. All right, you know? well... For those who don't know, define, please. Well, I think Durag diplomacy is the act of translating our culture and our food, you know, a across the globe. You know, and, um, we could translate it. We translate it through food. We translate it through the way we speak, the way we dress. And we, that's, you know, just bringing the Bronx to the world and the world to the Bronx. Yeah, for sure. And I'll just piggyback on that. Like, for instance, when we went to Paris early on, We'd be pulling up do rags, customs offices, and like, what are y'all? Okay, First excuse and foremost, me one second. Speaking as the oldest person probably in the room, define do rag. <laughs> oh, the do rag, man. If you knew better, you do better, man. So you put it on your head, man. Put the waves down. If you ain't got waves, it's for the braids. All right. You know what I mean? Capes waving and misbehaving, you feel me? Do the right thing, man. <laughs> do rag the right thing. Indeed. Precisely. You talk oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to pick that up, so like we go to different places around the world and they see us based on our, how we present and think that we're rappers or DJs, but little do they know that we might be taking over the Place Vendôme to create a Bronx Brasserie. I know I probably butchered my pronunciation of that, but... Are you doing fine? I did my best. You know, we're just doing our best up here. Um, but, but yeah, so it's like that different type of outlook. Like, so don't underestimate when you see brothers or sisters that look like us, you never know what they might be up to. It might not be your first thought. And I won't, I won't call out any names, but I will say that, you know, sometimes the perception is that those judgments are coming from outside of the community. Sometimes they're coming from inside the community. And I know these guys have told me stories about getting corrected or corralled at events like, you know, you shouldn't you, you shouldn't just take that off your head. You shouldn't dress like that, you know, blah, blah. And these guys have always adhered to their core ethic, their core value, their identity. And so a big part of that Durag diplomacy is saying, we're going to show up as who we are, bring in the energy from where we're from, and we're not replacing it with anything else. We're not making you feel more comfortable. We are who we are. You're going to feel comfortable with us. You're going to get to know us, or you, know, you don't have to be here. Kindly, respectfully. We bring. So, you know, that's also part of Durag diplomacy is, you know, you're coming with open arms, but you don't have to stay if you don't like it. Yeah. We're bringing that, we bring that disruption, you know? Disruption and combustion, man. Yeah, you know and, and, and with the Durag diplomacy, for us, it's really about, you know, not, not conforming, you know, not um, code switching when we go into places because growing up, we never saw people that look like us in these spaces. And, you know, for us to be able to go into the world's number one restaurant and sit in the wine cellar with our do-rags on and get spoon-fed tortellini by, you know, the world's best chef. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> honestly, honestly, I never saw anybody like that doing that, doing things like that in the space looking like us when we grew up. So we just want to be an example as well for everybody to know that, you know, you don't have to take your capes off, you don't have to take your hijabs off. Like, just, just, own, just own, your, you know, own the culture and just be yourself. Be accepted for who you are, by where you are, and what you are in the real world. Real world. Judge a book by its cover, but in our case, 
In our case, you can judge us. We got our own book, man. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, Asai, how did you take the ephemeral identity of Ghetto Gastro and make that intangible something that we all can feel into something that is literary and consumable and that can be held in two hands when you buy the book, hint, hint. That's the big question. That was the question they asked me too when we met in February up at the, the former test kitchen, 134th. The February 2020, before, before it all went down, right? Um, I, the, the truth is, I don't know how it happens because some of that is just between God and, and my ancestors, right? Like I, a lot of my job as a writer is just listening and showing up. But the, the skill that helps the talent come through that I feel like I have been gifted with is learning to listen and to pay attention very attentively and to bring what is my own voice. You know, this is the Ghetto Gastro book, but it's a lot of me in this book. Um, particularly during a time when we were all, at least I was, I was struggling. I was on the floor a lot in 2020. John and I, I mean, our text messages at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., how are you doing? I'm on the floor crying, listening to, you know, the OJs, like, it's like... I'm you know, like, just make sure that hand is moving while you're crying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> real way. Real way. He came with the, she came with the Suge Knight pressure at first. I was like, I'm tender. I need support. Uh, but, you know, like... Tenderoni. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I mean, a lot of it probably looked like a lot of partying and hanging out. But, you know, I was telling someone earlier in the green room... Um, Writers don't always look like they're working, and that's a hard thing for people to understand because books take a long time, and they require a deep, deep consciousness, and I think a lot of slow attention, and we're not moving slow very much these days. Um, and, uh, you know, a photographer comes in the room, you, you see them, click, 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 flash, flash, you know, it's like, okay, you're taking pictures, taking pictures. With a writer, you know, you're listening. I, I talked to all of them first, um, individually, after I came on board the project. Um, I spent a lot of time reading what was already out there, and then I just had to be in their world. It's, it's, it was hard to define Ghetto Gastro. They couldn't really, really define themselves. They were like, so here's what we do, here's who we are, here's our place, here's our people, you know, and it really just took time. I remember the first time we hung out as a group, you were still out of the country, but they had been waylaid in Caymans for the first few months of this project. They wanted a writer at the beginning who was based in New York. I was already moving to New York at the time. I was the only mofo in New York for months. I don't know where Les was. These guys were in Caymans. I would get on the Zoom. You know, people were in swim trunks. P would leave. Like I was like, where is he going? Like, I'm talking to you. Um, you know, <laughs> take a quick dip in the ocean. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, but Osai, Osai. Number one question. Osai. Let's, so I'm let's, coming back to you. But like, come back to me. But, but even more than that. The, but the, but yes, I'm getting. But the, question, the answer to your question is the the corralling. It was it was just being with, and that that's a really hard thing for people to accept. Is that it's just soaking in and getting to know and getting getting intimate and, and hearing the stories, and that that is how you start to distilled down so that when I sit down and write, it's just naturally coming through. I can speak very fluent ghetto gastro now. Okay, but I want to ask one more piggyback on that, and then I'm going to let the guys talk about themselves. Um, you've done books with other people. How is this one different? One, two, three. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Well, then, and, but also, and... A mandate, right? I mean, John said from the very beginning, we want a bestseller. And I'm like, wow, you are so far ahead. Like, you're showing me pictures. I have, you know, we don't have an outline, you know, like we, but, you know, let's start, let's start, we have to start from the ground, right? We start from the ground. And so to do that across one person is hard. You can ask any co author, no matter what their work has done. Um, uh, chefs, particularly are like notoriously bad, you know, they make one thing, ta-da, we're done, you know, hands, pick it up, you're over it. 
two and a half, three years, like that is not the chef's like happy place, right? You're like, how are we still working about, you know, two, year, two hours, we're still talking about the same recipe, like how, why? There's a lot of convincing sometimes, you know, but the, 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 that's the beauty of this book is that I think you see the three of them individually. I think you see them as a cohesive unit. I, see, I think you see them as a call to action for so many of us. And I think you see me too. And I think that's Well, the I mean, I think we also see them as extraordinarily generous because in many cases of authors, that person's name is on the book and you never see them. And here you are front and center. So gentlemen, to your generosity as well. Yeah. All right. we, were all, we were all raised by strong black women. So, you know, it's only right we, we, we incorporate that feminine energy in our book. All right. So, Okay, but now, Pierre, what is this GG effect, and how is it demonstrated in this work that I refuse to call a cookbook? Crookbook. It's a crookbook, right? Because <laughs> um, the user is stealing, because we're giving away so much game in there. 40 bucks? You, you kidding me? My grandma's in the audience. I would usually say something else. <laughs> <laughs> grandma! Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, for us, the... I think the GG effect is really just about, you know, sharing and community building um, on, across all different aspects, right? For us, it's, we know that community builds immunity on our side. So being able to work with our peers, our friends, people that we trust, that we love, um, people's work that we respect, I think that was the most important thing for us working on this book when we were thinking about the stories we wanted to tell, the artwork we wanted to display, you know, even when it comes down to the photography, we worked with know, close friends on all of this. Our, our buddy Joshua Woods right here in the front. Naquan, I know he's in the here. building somewhere as well. Oh, I got it. Josh has been on the road with us around the world for years. So when it came down to talking about who's going who's gonna to shoot the lifestyle photography for our book, for us, it was no question. And nah, we it. questioned it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it. <laughs> Yeah, and that, I mean, I, and that, I think that's the effect, right? It's just about showing everybody how, you know, how far you can go when you work together. It's, you know, there's plenty, of food, there's plenty out there for everybody to eat, and, you know, we, we just want to be a platform to showcase, you know, ourselves, but also the, the beautiful work that everybody else around us creates as well. I want to quote a famous uptown hustler, <laughs> <clears throat> AZ Faison, everybody eats, B, on our team, man. You know what I'm saying? So it's really a family affair to whoever's close and tight knit with us. We got we to gotta see for you at the table, because you ain't, if you ain't at the table, you're on the menu, man. Oops. <laughs> you get me. OK. <laughs> OK, and as you said, there is this extraordinary photographic element to the work that goes so far beyond the usual food porn of delicious dishes that make you want to eat the page, but captures really the cultural ethos of a time and place. The Bronx, New York, 2021. So John, could you give us a look at some of the incredible photographic work by Naquan Schuyler, Schuyler and Joshua Woods that was commissioned for the book because the, it was an integral part of it. So tell us about that. Yeah, like, like P mentioned, so much of our language at Ghetto Gas shows visual. Are y'all seeing the screen behind me? Okay, well, I'll talk about it. So, so, so much of... Is, can we call up the photos on the screen? Yeah, I noticed when we were in the back that we're I... done in this town. Well, I'll talk, I'll talk while, while we wait. <laughs> well, while we wait, talk about the first one that we're seeing that you're not. So listen to him, and we so, will make it so, work. So yeah, the visual, visuals are such a huge part of our language um, and communication. Because we're dealing with like a lot of younger people, millennials, Gen Z, that often might not want to want to read their words, but they could take in the visuals. So for us, like Pete mentioned, working with Joshua Woods, like Joshua just flew in from Paris to be here tonight. So give it up to him. Bravo. And then Naquan came through and, and did his thing on the food photography. So it's really just about how do we distill and create another vernacular through, through the visuals and just really 
recontextualize what a book with recipes is, right? So that's that's kind of the vibe. Yeah, and so no downtime. When when it when it came to like what John is talking about being visual learners, I know when I pick up a book, the first thing I look for, at least with food, is I'm looking for the photography. I'm looking for to see if it looks like something that I would want to make, or even just to kind of like. Uh, understand a little bit more about what's going on in the book. And I think that just with the visuals that we were able to put in there, that we were able to kind of stretch the stories and be able to really show a, a vast, diverse sort of uh, view on global blackness. And in addition to like photography, is so many visual art contributions. So we had Oasis DuVernay do a lot of illustrations for the, for the different interviews, that conversations that we had. She did the opening to the Rebel Without a Cause chapter, and we've been collaborating with her for the past decade. Her art is actually the first art I acquired as a custodian of, of artwork, so it's been amazing to have this decade-long relationship. All right, just news from the front. The energy was so much it blew out the projector, so they're, they're fixing the projector. So let's just go on, talk a little bit about the art and how you commissioned it, and then we'll get back to them when the projector is up again. Yeah, I think, I think because Ghetto Gastro is such a multidisciplinary project, like we work in food, but it's also fashion, visual arts, activism. Like we just wanted to tap into our community. So it was like potluck, you know, from, I see Hugh Hayden right there, so who hosts potluck. So we had like the homies come through. It's like, you want to get down? Let's, let's, let's do this. And just also looking at the different moments in the book where certain work and certain conversations were meant to be had. So everything is very intentional. And you'll see that as you, as you scroll through those pages, and scroll through as you turn the pages. <laughs> and part of that visual identity comes, well, a lot of it, a lot of that, these guys, are, you know, are visual people, I think, primarily, certainly, you had a lot of images that you were showing me, I remember back in February 2020. Um, but the copy drives everything. You know, you can have ideas, and if a, if a copy doesn't, fulfill on that or pay off on it, it, it it's a misjoint, it, you know, it, it doesn't pair well. And you've seen this, you've seen this, you've seen this TV, film, magazines, you know, all kinds of places where people wanted to lead with the pictures and the work couldn't support it. So it was really important for my role to have that gravitas and that sense of, you know, every head note, that, that section that precedes the recipe, that section that a lot of folks online are always complaining about, like, why do I have to hear about this? You have to hear about it. Well, we can talk about that, too. But, you know, it helps facilitate that pastor's prologue, that sense of, you know, this artwork is, is speaking from the past as well, but we're also looking in a forward-thinking well, way. So it's all working together. Yeah, that's the point. It all comes together. Um, let's just talk about some of the recipes. Uh -huh. Okay, because while I don't think it's a cookbook, I refuse to call it a cookbook. Yeah. I will continue to call it a manifesto, because oh, it's a manifesto. Um, talk to me about three things. Red drink, red drank, <laughs> maroon shrooms, and nutcrackers. <laughs> well, nutcrackers, <clears throat> I'll start off with the nutcrackers. And <laughs> All right. You got to finish with the Nemo's. nutcracker. Remember you people's got, mamas in the house. We got Nemo's, too, <laughs> nutcracker. But a, a nutcracker's originated in our community, so that's the way we express ourselves. That's the way how we tell stories. See, Ghetto Gastro, we're not just cooks. We're not just authors. We're, we're storytellers. You know, we tell our stories through our art, and our art happens to be, you know, photography, painting, sculpting, culinary arts, and... Um, that's the way we, we, we tell our story. Like, when you think about food, you think of nutrition, right? And nutrition is feeding the body, but we don't just want to feed the body. We want to feed the body, the mind, and the soul. You know, so it's really important that we are, that we, it, it, that we integrate yeah. Them, yeah. that we're integrating and we're weaving, you know, the arts into the young readers, even the, even the older readers, you know? It's, it's really important that we weave that into you know, the, the, the whole ethos that we have. Yeah, and to uh, piggyback on what Les is talking about with like, with Nutcrackers, you know, that's, for us, that's uh, uh, like our first view into entrepreneurism, into culinary entrepreneurism, right? Because Nutcrackers are selling 
they're selling these drinks, these beverages, and well, tell they, people and, what they are. Yeah, no, uh, well, a, nut, a, nut, a nutcracker, a nutcracker yeah. is a cocktail, is a bottled cocktail basically that's served on ice um, out of the cooler by uh, by a, a hustler on the streets. Um, it's vibes, man. It's vibrations. It's vibes. Everything under the kitchen sink might be in that drink. Yeah. And you might actually get the kitchen sink in the drink. Yeah. Too. It could be one. It could be one and done with a nutcracker. So you got to be careful. A hey, slow creeper. It's a slow creeper. But you know, seeing things like that, you know, and uh, just understanding what it takes to be an entrepreneur and to do something like that, and then uh, for us to be able to distill that, put it into the book, and also be able to serve dishes like that around the world where we're able to talk about the things that we see in the places that we've, uh, you know, the things that we've learned when we're growing up um, is really important. And then from the nutcrackers into the, the red drank. Red drank. Uh, we're talking red drank. We're talking about uh, hibiscus or jamaica or bisop. If you, you know, West African, uh, if you're speaking from West African descent. Or sorrel. Yes, or sorrel, you know, shout out Wagwan. to- Wagwan. Shout out Enough to all the- Enough get breathed. Ayo, yeah. ayo. <laughs> ayo, ayo. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah for, for, you know, and for us, it's really about being able to highlight these ingredients and how we can incorporate them and show different ways that we grew up uh, consuming them. Because you see a lot of products out here that are coming out on the market that might be using ingredients like hibiscus and things like that, but they're not seasoned the way that we would season them or mm -hmm. they're not flavored. And for us, it's about understanding that people are going to also try to take the sauce and we want to show everybody how to, how to actually properly get the recipe right, you know, so. And to put it in the canon, and before you get to maroon streams, I just want the correlation of the red drink and the nutcrackers is important. The reason why you have nutcrackers is because of redlining and people not, black people, not being able to get licensing for selling alcohol. So you have, you know, these cottage industries that have proliferated, and this is not just in the Bronx. This is all throughout the country. This is, you know, all kinds of markets. You know, if you're in New Orleans, you're gonna find a version of this. If you're in Miami, you're gonna find a version of this. This is systemic, and this is the, the, the through line of the book is that, yeah, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna show you pretty things, you're gonna, you're gonna lace it up with champagne, cognac, all those things, but understand that there are people who, you know, outside the parks, outside your concerts, outside your whatever function is happening summertime, these folks are out here working. They're working, they're batching the stuff out. They're, they're calling it cool things. They're naming it after the hit jam. They're naming it after whatever the cool cartoon character, whatever it is, they're out there and they got rhymes. You pay attention if you're not, just not from your community, you know, you, you'll see this. You see it at Prospect Park and it's crossing a lot of cultures now, but that's, that's the correlation and that red drink is going back to a Juneteenth conversation. It's going back to, as, as P said, you know, a West African correlation. So we're showing that, yes, this might look like somebody just running up and down the street with an igloo, but this is coming from a place that is centered at the, at the core of civilization. Like, that's my job to, th to thread that through. So you understand when you're talking about nutcrackers, whatever it looks like to you, you're gonna talk about it with some respect when you read this book. So that's, that's what we're talking about. I like that. And it's, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's really about sovereignty. It's really about sovereignty and uh, like owning our own IP, you know? Like, that's really important to us. So the sovereignty of the Nutcracker, the sovereignty of the Red Drank, the claiming or reclaiming that which is already ours by right and history. And maroon shrooms. Well, the maroon shrooms, that's, you know, that for us, that's a, that's a really important dish because that's our play on, on jerk, um, our plant-based play on jerk. So, and it's also like a, lo it's a low glycemic dish as well because we understand that our community faces a lot of these uh, health issues and these underlying health conditions that are created by the systems that be. But we wanted to utilize different ingredients that we've learned and different techniques that we've picked up across our travels around the world. So instead of using sugar, we're using uh, you know, the, the natural sweetness from apples and Japanese pears. And in order for us to get some more umami flavor to come across, we're using roasted kombu. And you'll see that we have the scotch bonnet and the allspice in there so that when you're glazing it up on the grill and it's nice and smoky and it's nice and charred, that you're getting all of these flavors, you're tasting the stories, you're tasting the history, and you're also tasting the technique because at the end of the day, like, we could cook too, you know and just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cook good, look good, you feel me? Cook good, so, look good. So, and, and just to give you some knowledge on maroons, that's like, 
people that broke from bondage um, in Jamaica, in also Mexico, different communities, Cimarrones, it's well, like a- Well, Cimarron being Cimarron. a Spanish word, and Cimarron translates into the English as maroon, and it's the folks, well, particularly in Jamaica as maroon, and most folks forget that Jamaica was Spanish before it became British. And when the British came, there were a whole group of folks who said, oh, hell no, we ain't doing this, and headed for the Blue Mountains, the Maroons. And so you get the Maroons who have their own culinary culture, their own way of being, and who are at the origin of jerk. Um, so you get all of that happening, but then you get the shrooms along with the Maroons, which takes it to the GG effect, I guess. The lingo. Steez with ease. Yeah, just want just, just to show, show everybody that, you know, once we, if we were to take the same sort of approach and care, handling all of our ingredients, whether it's animal-based or it's plant-based, that you can get the same sort of flavors, the same mouthfeel, the same nostalgic moments, that like when you close your eyes and you bite into a mushroom, that you can still even feel like, damn, this tastes like a piece of jerk chicken, or you know, it tastes like something that, I was, that I'm accustomed, accustomed to eating, but it's, but it's still new. Yeah, it's something I know, but it may be better for me than the thing I know. <laughs> yes, indeed. And the piggyback of what all y'all are saying is like, <clears throat> it's kind of like what Gigi does, turning a survival technique into something luxurious and, you know, and, 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 and noteworthy. So also the Maroons did that as well with the, with the jerk technique because mm -hmm. they, they, they smoked their product underground so the so the slave masters you know so the slave masters couldn't see the couldn't smoke see coming the smoke. up in the air so they cooked it underground so you get all of that smoke infused into the whatever product that you um that you marinated and that, that that whatever you jerked yeah no absolutely you and know, in fact so it was the war food of the maroons and one of the first people to write about it in english was Zora Neale Hurston that's a fact Bing That's bong. why we got a doctor on the stage, y'all. Yeah. Dropping those bars, yeah? yeah? Each one teach one, man. Steel sharp as steel. <laughs> as I said, this is not a cookbook. It's a manifesto. But as such, it was a collaborative work. And so I know you got folks in the house who need some shout outs. So talk about those folks who helped you over place, over time, over your lives, get to this point where, as you said, Mott Haven at the Met. Mott Haven to the Met, and I gotta thank Mama. You know, mama! I gotta, thank, I gotta thank women like you, Dr. Jessica Harris, you know? I gotta thank, thank you, Yo gotta, Mama. Gotta thank that feminine energy that, you know, taught me how to, you know, how to navigate out here, and um, um, amazing, amazing artists as well, man. Uh, my man Alvin Armstrong, you know, uh, the Omawakus, the, uh, you know, the Kerry James Marshalls, you know, the Dream Hamptons with amazing interviews, Kimberly Drews, you know, the list goes on, man. Thelma Golden, yeah. Dream Hampton, I think you might have said Dream. That's it. Aster, Emery Douglas, Black Emery. Panther, oh, Minister of Culture. Can't forget Emery. Ferg. ASAP Ferg, Harlem on the Rise, Uptown Reigns. If, yeah. if Harlem's in the building, let him get a year. Right. Yeah. Where Bronx? Where the Bronx at, man? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You get me. And then our publisher, because because our publisher, our management crew, because it's not easy to deal with us because we're so singular in our point of view. So when it's like we want this thing to be this thing that's like never been done before, it's a fight, but it it comes out being beautiful. So. Being able to translate that and have great partners so we could create this baby together has just been a huge blessing. Okay. It's a beautiful struggle. Okay. Yeah, and um, I, I don't know, man. Any, 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 anybody who's, who's just been with us along the way, you know, our families, um, Ness, Ness, our man who helps us out with all the sound and AV for our events. You know, we had we got CC here in the front row, who's been Cece. a consigliere for the team since before since before I was down with the gang. So you know, it's like it's really about even our partners over here at La Mirada. We see you in the Carolina yeah. and, and Marco. You know, for us, it's really just about everybody around us who's been our support system, helping us get to this point because we didn't do this by ourselves. You know, like. The five of us are sitting up here on this stage, and you know we get a lot of the we get a lot of credit up here. But at the end of the day, we did this with everybody around us. So 
Joshua, Naquan, a uh, new studio helping us with the design, Vegas with the lighting. I mean, anybody who contributed to the book. Stick Sabella, Stick Sabella with, with the food the styling. Food styling Sonia, Sonia on, the, the, on the set design. Elle and Zoe Maya on the testing on those the te recipes. Recipe so they work in your kitchen and not in these fancy kitchens. Not yes. your fancy mm -hmm. kitchen. <laughs> You know, you know. See this? See the shade? I got an actual kitchen now. When we started this process, I didn't have a kitchen, but that's another story. No. Yeah. We was trapping out the band, though. Yeah, we just want to show love to everybody because, on, honestly, without everybody who who helped us out, this book wouldn't be possible. So, big ups to big ups to I all. I see of Dan you. from Sky High Farms in the building. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Here. Sky High. I'm mad this projector's not working because we want you to see some visuals. Yeah, so. I want the projector to work. But y'all got to buy Shout out, like Ms. I flew Denise. Out here Shout man. out, Rox. I ain't going to put my son on the big screen. No, Trust man. me, it's there. It's on the little screen. If y'all want to look at the little screen for a moment well, and see what's going on. Well, we may have to make everybody that. turn around and it's look like, at the little screens. See, see what's going on. You know, Yo, just like, hold me on the visuals. You're you, done. You see Naquan right there with Shana. You know, Josh Shana with the Coco Hilado, Brian Fernandez. Fire hydrant, you know, New York vibes. You see the vibes. No the little vibes. screens being Rashad, seen, though. Rasheed Johnson and Kim Dick is in the building on that one. If you African turn around, roots. they're behind you. These screens on little right screens. They're behind you, but they're also about in the, the book. only way it seems you're going <laughs> to see them tonight. We got you but back. also, if you want to trickle that nickel, that's in the book. The other so. thing is, just buy the book. Shout they're out there. to the lip bar. <laughs> They ringing themselves up, black owned, you know. Shout out Noel from the lip bar. Run it up. Okay, let's get back on to some more questions though. As people of African descent, especially in this hemisphere, we know that everything we do is a political act. How do you want this book to speak to people? Well, we call it the Bible, right? We call it our Bible. It's our basic instructions before leaving earth. We want it to be a foundation for people, to, you know, for everybody to understand that, you know, there's levels to this. And, you know, when we really apply ourselves, um, you know, the possibilities and the places that we can go and the things that we can achieve and what we can reach and, you know, that this is just a stepping stone really for, for anybody who is looking to excel and be a better version of themselves and who wants to reverberate that out to their community and their loved ones. The ripples out. We made, Ripple. we made this book as politically correct as possible. So the leftists can ring it, read it, the right <laughs> can read it. You're going somewhere else. You know what I mean? You're like, what? <laughs> now you know you're wrong. <laughs> oh, boy. Listen, it's, it's secrets in here that we share, man, and everybody <laughs> needs to see, everybody needs to read. So it doesn't True. matter, it doesn't matter, you know, what political side you take, you know? The isms in there, man. The secrets are in there, man. The, 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 there's the secrets to longevity and life in there, you know? Well, that brings me to this. As chefs, particularly you and Pierre, you know that food is sometimes perceived of as being a nice, neutral topic. You know, we can all talk about food. Isn't that fun? But it can also clearly be a loaded one. You coined the term conscious cuisine. Now, what do you mean by that? And how would you like the book to move us forward to eating consciousness? Well, when we talk about conscious, conscious cuisine and conscious consumption, you know, it's really, we're not demonizing any sort of eating style or saying that you need to eat a certain way, but really what we want everybody to understand is what you put in your body is what you're gonna put out. And we really just need to treat our bodies like a, temp like a temple, it's our inner sanctum, and that we really need to just feed it the things that we, for us to excel and uh, op operate at our, you know, at our highest capacity. Um, food is not a neutral topic in our community because it's, it's been weaponized against our people for such, a, for such a long period of time where we're not even able to have access to, you know, fruits without pesticides and, you know, greens that are at an affordable price, it's easier for you to just go and grab a soda and some Twinkies and a Snickers than it is for you to actually sure. grab a salad in the South Bronx or in a lot of communities around the country. So for us, we really want to just flip any of those narratives on their head as to what we should be eating, how we should eat it, and what actually deems what luxury food is because we know what luxury is. like. 
people build empires off of our backs, off of our natural resources, off of our skill sets. So for us to reclaim that power and to show everybody through food and art and through storytelling, I mean, that's what it's all about. And so we're getting down toward time winding down with unfortunately no visuals, but what are our marching orders? As we leave here and return to our worlds, hopefully all of you with a copy of the book in your hands. Not just one, like <laughs> all right. one for At every least... hand and leg, arm, all of like, <laughs> <laughs> What do you want us to do? What do you want us to read? What do you want us to think about? And I'll start with you, Pierre, and work my way around. Damn, you started with me. Um, wow. <laughs> what do I want you to do? I want you to buy the book. Um, honestly, outside of that, I just want everybody to, you know, honest, buy the book, take care of yourself, read it, nourish yourself, nourish those around you. Uh, anything to read, read Black Power Kitchen. Um, I really got nothing else. I'd say, you know, definitely buy the book, cook the book. But also for this, this has been an illustration of us taking our skills and our gifts and using them to put forth something that hopefully catalyzes people to liberate black and brown bodies and uplift our communities and using what we have to do that, you know? So I think everybody in the audience has gifts and has tools. So it's like, put those gifts to work and, you know, make it pop. What I want is for folks to be able to see themselves and to also understand why certain things are happening to them. I think as a writer, one of my biggest driving questions and anything that I take on is, okay, this thing happened to me, this thing I observed or this experience that I had, but what's going on here? What's really going on here? And I think that for a lot of people, I, I saw some teenagers page through this book this week and um, they were just, you know, they just stopped listening to people talking. They were in the pages. They were seeing themselves. They were hearing. I say hear because when you read, you hear. They were hearing language that 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 that, that they speak, um, and they also, yeah, I I hope we're connecting the dots that, you know, who I am and where I live happened for a reason for for things that people tried to do and things that were done to us or to them. So to bring that full circle. We live in a society that makes us think that everything is our individual choice, and a lot of us didn't opt into this shit. So I, I would think that a big part of Black Power Kitchen is taking a look back globally, locally, individually, collectively, spiritually, and saying that you know we're counting on each other in ways that we're not always accountable for, and we have an opportunity here to do things differently in our individual choices, but also in the, uh, the folks who represent us and in, and in the, and the effort that we make collectively to, to live bigger and live healthier and live fuller lives. So I want us all to get some of that from this book. Yeah, they said a lot, man. But um, I would say um, <clears throat> take accountability for the calories that we put in our bodies. And when I say that, I mean, like, <clears throat> we are what we eat, and um, what we eat goes back into the earth. So it's really important that we take accountability for this food that we eat. And, um, you know, and as far as being in your community, spread the gospel, you know, be a pillar of your community. And, um, you know, cop one, cop two, cop three, man. There you Maybe go. Four. I forgot one. No, I just wanted to shout out Discord, you know, who are supporting the book tour and really been great partners. And, yeah. Lots happen to that, you know, follow us on all of the social media platforms. If you don't, trickle nickels, you know, socket tile park it like a skyrocket, all of those things. All those things. Okay. <laughs> and I have one last question. And here I'm going to be the yeah, school teacher up. from the planet. Mm -mm -mm. One word. One word each. Final word you're going to leave us with. What's your one word? Word and I do mean one, Osai. One word. Ashe. Black. Joy. Ah oh, man, that's too. <laughs> you had to. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
The book is for sale. There are signed copies out back. Obtain one or more. And we'll see you on the other side. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, just, just so you know, they, they starting to print the second edition, so you know those first edition resale price is going to be hey. up there. So it's yes. an investment in your future. You feel me? It's an investment in your future. Yesterday's price yesterday's is not price. today's price, man. <laughs> going up. I think we got that. We're going to be the first.